Okay, I'm very excited to have on the Goldstein on Gelt show, Michael F. K., who actually very much like me is a certified financial planner and he is an author, except he did not write Rich as a King. He wrote a book called The Feel Rich Project, which is about transforming your relationship with money. Now, Michael, in my book, Rich as a King, one of the things we focused on was this concept of behavioral finance because my experience, and I'm guessing kind of like yours, is that the reason people often do badly managing their money is not because of technical things. It's because they they just get so emotionally messed up about it that they end up making the wrong decisions. Is that kind of your, your experience as well? Yeah, Doug, I think there's a lot of things that go into the mistakes we make or the direction that we take our lives. And so much of it is formulated based on what we've learned about money growing up from a child's eye and a child's ear as to what becomes our normal. For instance, if we grow up in a family where our parents teach us it's important to save for a rainy day or don't buy something that you can't buy with cash or don't go into debt, then those are supportive money habits and, and messages that children receive. But a lot of children grow up where parents never talk about money at all. It's a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. So they grow up with this mystery around money, or they grow up hearing things like, uh, it's important to show people that you're successful through your trappings, through what you wear, or what car you drive, or whatever it is. Those things become what's normal to us. And that becomes our kind of hardwired operating system. Interesting. And the idea behind the Feel Rich Project is to Take a look at that kind of wiring, that that money story that goes on in our heads and see, does it support us or does it not support us? And if it doesn't, how can we kind of rewire our mindset so that we think differently? So can people really rewire their mindset if their parents were bad with money? I mean, the problem is you can just look at the debt in, in America, for example. It shows that parents in general, on average, are probably pretty bad with money and they're the ones teaching the next generation. So... What hope does someone have? You know, let's say you discover your parents are bad with money and you say, I just don't want to do the same thing. I don't want to fall into that trap. What would you suggest someone do other than obviously buy your book? (laughs) Well, (laughs) that's a good place to start. The idea here is to start to create for yourselves those ideas of what is it that you value so highly that you're willing to make changes for? What will allow you to put your head on the pillow at night and feel that you're moving in the right direction. So it becomes a matter of choice and a matter of choices that we make. Would I rather kind of fall into this lockstep pattern of destructive behavior or would I rather install new habits that will allow me to move closer to? So for example, one might say, okay, well, my normal course of action would be to go online and order something that kind of catches my eye because I feel like it, or I need some retail therapy, I'm gonna go to the store and go shopping, versus the idea of saying, you know what, I really need financial security and I can't have people calling me uh, that I owe them money or late on the credit cards or on my mortgage. So I need to start putting money aside. I need to create new habits that will bring me closer to each little step. And again, this this sounds a little bit like an easier said than done. You know what I mean? It all sounds well and good. If your parents messed up with money, then you have to make sure that you have good money habits. And I think that a lot of people hear guys like you and me saying this, and then, you know, they're sort of, you and I are saying all the right things, and they're saying, yeah, yada, yada, yada. How do you get someone to actually say, listen, you know, you can't have so much debt. Stop charging everything on the credit card. Don't do the retail therapy that you're talking about. Come on, man, straighten yourself out. How do you get someone to actually change those habits? That, that's a great question. And the fact is, is that when you have a conversation with someone where they're able to share that pain, what is it that they go through on an ongoing basis? Are they getting phone calls? Are they getting threatening letters? And how does that feel? And how would your level of satisfaction with your, your financial life be different? You know, what, what would make it different? Well, I, didn't get, I don't get the calls, or I have money in the bank, or I don't owe the credit card companies money. Well, how would we make that happen? Where are the choices? So the first stop along this, this continuum is to take a look at where are we now? What money comes in the door? Where's money going out the door? What are our fixed costs? Where are our discretionary costs? What are the things we can make choices about? And if we make some small choices, 
we say, okay, instead of doing X, we're going to do Y. We're going we're gonna to shave down our, uh, some of our, our decisions. So we're not going to go cold turkey. We're, it's not like going on a diet and eating nothing but carrot sticks and celery sticks because it's unsustainable. So what are the small things we can do to say, okay, let's cut out dessert or instead of cake, let's have a bowl of fruit. Let's not feel like we're completely in this denial mode, but let's make some small financial steps that will give us a taste that we're not going to die from from not being able to do these things, but we're actually improving our lives. So it's, it's, it's the shifts. It's the small shifts that occur that support us in making bigger changes as we go. We're talking with Michael F. K., certified financial planner and also author of the book, The Feel Rich Project. He's, he's been talking to us about how when we're young, we actually learn with a, with a child's eye and ear about how to hand, handle money because our parents teach us. And some, some people are lucky and their parents teach them well. And some people maybe don't get such good education. And Michael's been pointing out that you have to start to create for yourself an understanding of what you value, what's really important to you, so important that you'd in fact be willing to make changes in your life. So if, for example, it's really important to you to feel the security that maybe one day you'll be able to retire, you might have to make changes in your spending today in order to save more money. But one thing Michael pointed out is that you shouldn't make radical changes. You can start small and with small steps. Michael, I know one of the things you talk about is what you refer to as money musts and how they work day to day. Tell me what you mean by money musts. When we operate our lives on a daily basis, we kind of are on autopilot. And we don't even think about it, we, it, it because we're, our minds are elsewhere. So in creating your musts, you, you're really creating what, what I call like almost a billboard of your standard, of your what it is that you stand for. What is it that must happen that's so powerful in your life that you're going to kind of carry with you in your moment-to-moment -moment decisions? And I recommend that people will write these musts down and read it you know, multiple times a day keep reminding themselves that there's something really important. So for some people, it's it might be getting out of debt. For other people, it might be, I, I want to save money so I can help put my kids through college or be able to retire and not be dependent on my children. What are those things that are so important, so deep inside of your guts, your marrow, your brain, your soul, that will help move the needle for you in making those moment-to-moment -moment decisions? I think the issue so, that a lot of people have with that is, I mean, maybe you found this too. People come in and maybe before you've trained them for how to, be, how to be a good client, they say, tell me, Michael, how much money can you make me on my investments? And then you have to say, whoa, back up a little bit. Let's, let's get started with some of the more basics. How does that conversation go for you? Well, you know, in our practice, we are what's called financial life planners. So we're really dealing with not only the quantitative aspects of you know, how do you increase return on a portfolio, what's missing from your estate plan or tax planning, et cetera. But we're dealing with the qualitative aspects of life satisfaction, money history, and where we are today. So we're kind of bringing the past, the present, and the future together in conversation. So in helping clients work through this process, we're understanding what are the things, what are the transitions they're facing? What are the things that are happening now? What do they expect to happen in five years or in 10 years? You know, we're seeing a lot of people who are parts of the sandwich generation where they've got older parents and younger children and they're caught in this squeeze. So what are these things in their lives that really fill up their concern, that fill up their desires? And how do we change the conversation away from the nuts and bolts so that what's really driving them in their decision making are those important transitions in their lives. And so the nuts and bolts of is your allocation towards, you know, small cap stocks too heavy or are you sitting too much in US stocks is not really a factor. It really it really focuses on those occurrences in life that really drive the car for them. Right. I think that that's a great point. I think that people really do get mired in the details of things like What's the specific asset allocation or how to manage it? And that's really something that they can outsource. What they can't outsource is understanding who they are and what's important to them. Michael, you've really covered a lot of very important things for us. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time today, however. So in the last few seconds, could you just tell us how can people follow you and follow your work? 
Sure. Uh, well, they could find me on michaelfk.com. Uh, they could read about the Feel Rich Project and what we do there. Or if they want to see some of the, the work that we do uh, on the planning side, they can certainly look at financial-lifefocus.com. And uh, they'll find the links if they want to follow me on Twitter or read my columns in, uh, in Forbes or in uh, Psychology Today. Okay, great. We will put links to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Michael F.K., thanks so much for taking the time. Doug, it was my pleasure. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Check out all of Doug's money ideas at goldsteinongelt.com. Doug specializes in helping people who live outside the United States handle their U.S. investment accounts. If you have a question that you would like answered on the air or off, contact Doug at his website or send him an email to doug at profile-financial.com. 